What's up, rockers? Welcome to another episode of the Talk Louder podcast, where we geek out on all things rock and roll. Hit that subscribe button on our YouTube channel. Leave us your likes and comments. You can also leave likes and comments on our Facebook page. Follow us on iTunes, Spotify, Instagram at Talk Louder underscore podcast. And check out our new updated website, TalkLouderPodcast.com, where you'll find links to uh, all of our previous episodes with our guests. I'm Metal Dave Glesner, along with my co-host, Jason McMaster. And today we've got Kyle Ellison with us on the show today. Kyle oh, is love this a, episode already. Oh my yeah, god! Yeah, Kyle is a is a friend of Jason's from way back. I've gotten to know Kyle a little bit over the years. Uh, sweetheart of a guy, uh, probably best known to most of you out there as the guitarist in Pariah, uh, alongside our producer Jared Tootin, the producer of the Talk Louder podcast. Um, He's also played with the Meat Puppets, Gibby Haynes from the Butthole Surfers. He's done shows with Rocky Erickson, almost two years apparently on the road with Rocky Erickson. Um, so a long uh, storied career, um, a friend of Jason's, a friend of the Austin music scene. And uh, he's, uh, he's with us today to share uh, the highs and lows of his life story up to this point and uh, a little bit about what's going on musically into the future. There is a lot, <clears throat> there's a lot going on with this guy, and um, it's not without uh, pain and, of course, some pleasure, but a uh, bump, bumpy ride because uh, his brother, Sims Ellison, um, uh, which some of you around, around Central Texas have probably heard of the Sims Foundation, where it's, uh, it's an organization where... Uh, artists and musicians and you know if you work for a band if anything has to do with music if you have any sort of like uh, if you need help if you're feeling suicidal uh, m mental care basically um, the Sims Foundation is an organization an organization specialized for for artists uh, who need that kind of care and uh, it's it it's there's um you know I don't know of a whole lot of organizations that care that much about um you know that part of of a city's life uh so i think that it's an important story so we talk about sims a lot we talk about the sims foundation quite a bit and um yeah uh kyle's sort of like career has been spotted with these just golden stars wow um, yeah. uh, ministry uh, like dave mentioned butthole surfers um, <clears throat> the Meat Puppets, Rocky Erickson, and there's more. Um, Renee Zilweger uh, and Sims dated for a while. And uh, so, so Renee, of course, is a friend of the family and um, was a part of the, a lot of people don't realize, was a part of that through Pariah and Sims and, 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 and that crew. Uh, she became... Uh, part of the rock and roll scene here in Austin, Texas. Yeah. Uh, Renee was at Jared's wedding. So, yeah. uh, you know, it's a, it's a trip, you know, hanging with my wife and my mom at Jared's wedding and like Renee Zellweger is right there. Hey dude, what's up? You know? Yeah. Uh, but, but he, during the lockdown, they started writing songs with Renee on vocals. So we talk about that a little bit. We don't know if, if that'll ever see the light of day, but, uh, mm -hmm. Let's hope so, because Renee can sing. Um, but Kyle Ellison is just a wonderful artist and very, very creative. And I feel like just everyone's going to learn a lot about Kyle, uh, Mr. Kyle Ellison, here on the Talk Louder podcast. <laughs> the sons are one of my all time favorites. Yeah, I, I always love their singer. Oh, and the Watchtower poster and the Dangerous Toys. And Jason was just telling me all about his Planet of the Apes while back there. So. Yeah, yeah, as you can notice, see. Notice how notice how Kyle has no doo doo behind him. <laughs> Dave and well, I, yeah, all, there's, there's, there's everything a keyboard behind back there. me and Dave is all doo doo, and then <laughs> what Kyle has is professional uh, recording studio uh, vibe. Tool, tools of the trade, yeah. 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 
Yeah. I, I can take you to the doo doo room, dude. Where like there's, I have like Ramones posters and Randy Rhodes posters in my kitchen. Oh, I have, I have no doubt that you you have your fan, a- you have your fanboy moment. But yeah, yeah. This me and Dave have the fanboy moment when we walk into the cave. So yeah, I know you guys got it going on. I love it. I'm like checking it all out. Mine my, my, my trickles into the living room and up the stairs. And thankfully, I have a wife who who uh, tolerates it because oh, it, it spilled most, out of here, as you can most, tell. The most fucked up thing about about, you know, Dave, and I don't take it. I don't take it wrong either way about having a cool wife who puts up with it is when Dave interviewed Gene Simmons, he goes, excuse me, she lets you she lets you hang up those kids posters. She lets you hang up, you know, all like mad, like like a yeah. woman. How dare you think, you know, ask permission from a woman to and coming, I thought that was coming of, from a man who's been used to ruling the world since 1974. Yeah. But we're, we're in well, different ball. It was kind of an asshole thing for him to say, but we are talking about Gene Simmons. So it's OK. Yeah, exactly. man. I used to have um, guitar cables and guitars and like pedals all over the floors and mic cables run into the bathroom and stuff. And um, my old girlfriend was like, dude, you know, I want to live in a house. And so um, I put all my stuff in this one little tiny room and it was all just packed in there. You know what I mean? And, um, and one of the few times um, I met Sean Lennon and he came over here to get some weed. If I could say that. And, um, <laughs> and um, he well, was we're like, talking about Sean Lennon. So, of course- <laughs> and then he was like, dude, why is your like, he was like, your whole musical life is like shoved into this little box, dude. He was like, this whole house should be a studio. And I was like, see? see? <laughs> <laughs> this is coming anyway. from a Lennon. Yeah. 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 She, was, she was smart. She left. <laughs> oh. <laughs> wow. Well, so who else has come over to your house? Uh, well, we won't get into your sideline business, I guess. But uh, you need to be able to spread out. And I think that's what he was saying. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he was just making a good point, which is like, dude, your life's music. And why is it? Why are you like confining it to like, you know? Yeah. I mean, I agreed with him. I also got why my girlfriend was bummed out at, you know, sure. you try sure. to sit, well, you try to go into the kitchen and there's like a, you know, a guitar pedal with the plates and like. <laughs> well, that, that sounds like it. it sounds like you just need a bigger space. So, so you know. That's true. It but I, just be well, yeah. They, you have she, your studio, and then you have a whole other space where where she is, where she doesn't have to look at, you know, the pedal in the kitchen. No, it was torture for her. She, this house, like, we have one bathroom, and then the you know basically this tiny little bedroom, and then my exploding old guitar cable box. <laughs> bigger, bigger space, happy wife, right? <laughs> So what have you been up to uh, musically lately, Kyle? Um, well, COVID really definitely did a number on everything. Right before COVID hit, you know, I was touring with Night Glitter and we were working a lot and we did the whole West Coast. And we did this whole run and we were like really on a good positive note. So someone who doesn't know anything about, I don't even know if I'm saying this right, Night Glitter? Night Glitter, yeah. What is that? What is that? Um, it's John Michael who played bass um, in the Happenings, and he also um, played with with me and Rocky Erickson. Okay. And um, and so it's a band that him and Lulu started, and Lulu is one of the singers in the Thievery Corporation. And okay. um, right. yeah, and, and John Michael and Lulu are you know a couple, and they started this band called Night Glitter. And the reason they named it Night Glitter was because John Michael's daughter he used to live down by the water in Wimberley. And John Michael's daughter would see the fireflies and she'd go, look, dad, night glitter. So, oh, so that's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. I, I thought it was really cool that there's actually a reason it's called night glitter and it's a yeah. super beautiful reason. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Uh, so you were up and running with, with night glitter and then, and then COVID happened. And well, and then we started making this record with Renee and we got six songs in and right as that was happening, COVID and like, and then, and in the middle of it, Renee thought she had COVID. And, um, so she was sick and like the whole thing just shut just down. For, just for, again, uh, this is quality control. Do I, do I look like a cop or something, but uh, I may- no, 
quality control here. When you say Renee, making sure listeners know you're you you are. I'm just guessing, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to be right that you're talking about Renee Zelliger. Well, you know, Renee was um, my brother who passed away, um, Sims Ellison. Um, Renee was, um, you know, Sims and Renee were a, a couple, and we all lived in this house out at in um, Rollingwood. Mm-hmm. And we had like Steve-O and we had Jeff Rimple, remember, who had the dip and the truck and worked at the 7-Eleven. And then Steve-O with all his BMXer friends and then Sims and Renee up in the top and then me downstairs growing a bunch of weed in the closet. And um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, but Renee is still a family friend and a friend of yours, Jason. And, no, you know. and, I, and I know and I know that, but you were I, I, I know that she she's uber talented and I enjoyed the shit out of her primetime tv show uh the thing about pam i loved that fucking show me and my (laughs) wife were watching the shit out of that and binging it we would sit on the couch together and watch it what i was just calling it renee time to watch renee but anyway um everybody knows that she sings but i didn't know that you were making a record with her yeah i didn't either well we started one and we got six songs in and um and then it just crumbled Okay. So we have six unfinished songs and, um, and it's, you know, every, that was when the hardcore lockdown happened. Remember? So everybody was kind of panicked. And, um, that's when I started digging holes in my backyard. Yeah. All right. We all turned into like, you know, <laughs> at first I was all stoked. I was talking to Sean Som about this because Sean Som was Doug Som's son, yeah. as a lot of people know. Of um, but we were like, right when the, lockdown hit we were like cool man we're just gonna hunker down in the studio we're gonna write all these songs and then you know cut to us like you know four months later like you know mentally ill and isolated and depressed and like (laughs) no songs and um (laughs) but um yeah it kind of had kind of just reminded me how like music really is about for me and most people you know the sharing of it and someone hearing it is a big part of that as much as i'm you know i'm an introvert i love you know, I don't have a problem being alone necessarily, but right. you know, it, it definitely that was extreme. That was an extreme version of it for me, particularly. Well, yeah, you're, you're yeah. not wrong about having to share share your your creations because that's how um, that's that's what makes the whole thing go round and around and 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 recreate and procreate. That's that's how the yeah. whole artist thing works. But uh, the uh, you have to go outside to get the influence. You have to leave the house to see something to feed your brain that's going to inspire you to go back and write the song or paint the painting or draw the picture, right? Oh, totally. I mean, that's... like you have to, you have to, like, like, would your friends have come up with the beautiful, most killer, most natural, organic band name, Night Glitter, if it wasn't? for their child going, seeing something that they would have ne- possibly never seen and put those words together. Look, dad, night glitter. Yeah. There's only so much inspiration that can come out of four walls. You can't look yeah. at your Randy Rhodes poster and get the, the ex- <laughs> get back out of it what you what you need all the time. Uh, Maybe some unless, other time. Uh, unless, um, unless you just want to keep covering Ozzy songs like I've done for the rest of my <laughs> Well, and there's nothing wrong with that, uh, but you know you should be out there in your Ozzy Randy tribute band if you're just going to do that. Um, but anyway, Leonard, Co- Leonard Cohen said something really cool about what you're talking about. He just said um, that you know he saw this stuff in the world that was so you know beautiful to him and important to him, and like, and he, he said he used to pray to have some sort of response to it, and yeah. then and that's how that's where the songs came from. That's what he is. I thought it was a cool thing that he said, you know? That's a great yeah. way to say it. And I, I, that's way more eloquent than me. Dude, you got to get outside so you get some more information so you can write something. I don't think else. you realize how eloquent you are, Jason. Uh, that's why we're here right now, so I can tell some Jason stories. No, we're here to uh, we're please here to, do start. Yeah, we're here to, to talk. Can I, tell, can I tell one Jason story that I love? Yeah, sure. let's, get, let's get it out of the way. I'm sorry. Yeah, let's get it out of the way so Jason can. Um, well, um, you know, we were a family band. We, you know, young kids, you know, we grew up together, me and Sims. And Shandon was like the, you know, the like the most famous person in our high school. And me and him would like 
argue over Kiss and Motley Crue because, um, you know, I was a super huge Kiss fan and then the elder happened. Right. So <laughs> like I was like already out of there. And right when all this transistor was happening was, um, you know, too fast for love and all that stuff. So, you know, I was like, dude, no, it's cool. It's cool. And he was like, dude, no, you know, the elder rocks or whatever. And, um, but um, so there was then the San Antonio music scene. There was all these um, people that we looked up to, you know, and Jason is a huge, huge, huge influence and a, a someone that I personally, and I know my brother really, you know, we just had a lot of respect for. And I, we were rehearsing and one day Sims just like he was, he was always really casual about stuff, but he was like, oh yeah, man, Jason's coming by. And I remember we were just all like, I'm just getting goosebumps now thinking about it. Cause we were all just like, dude, no way, Jason's coming by. <laughs> and um, Jason came by. And he sang with us. And I think if I remember right, we did um, Feeling for My Feeling, maybe, mm. or something. Maybe we just played some songs and you left and you were super cool. And, you know, I think my mom and, you know, you're just really nice and great. And I remember standing in the front yard talking to you. And um, and then you left, you know, and it was just like, oh, Jason was here. <laughs> and, um, you know, but then over the years, of course, we got to know Jason and, um. But before that happened, and this is one of my favorite stories that maybe Jason doesn't know, but um, Guns well, N' Roses. I remember coming. I remember coming over to to the house, quote the house, and jamming with you guys. And I and there was a couple of other times I came over. I think I even stayed the night once or twice. And I think I came over and brought some old Watchtower VHS tapes because you guys I remember that to all that out. And I think that might have been the time I slept on the couch there in the living room down there. And Betsy would come over and jam because sometimes Shandon couldn't make it. Or you guys were seriously like family band. And it's it's so cool. You guys are still in touch. Everybody's in touch with each other. Yeah, it's right. so, so cool. But uh, I felt like I was welcome into this this sort of like new crop of of peeps and i didn't it was like not a big deal to me to just like drive down to san antonio with a friend or something and hang out with you guys for hours and i met all y'all's people and we ended up doing gigs together i met jared before he was in pariah and cheater i don't know anything about cheater cheater was a really cool san antonio band and we played a um a battle of the bands with them and this was like you know i had a mullet and like <laughs> i had this like carbon guitar and we played um a battle of bands and I, if i remember right we were still a three-piece with shannon this band is called pariah that we're talking about yeah um but um i think we we're still a three-piece and we went in and you know played like cool and his caddy and all these like kind of songs that we had done and um early and then, pariah yeah. yeah and then cheater went on <laughs> And Cheater, what is, what is Cheater? Cheater was Jared's band, and oh. um, and they had like literally Taylor Hawkins type dude on drums that was just killer. He set up sideways, and Jared comes out there and just destroys this battle of the bands, how including us. How, how come I don't know about this <laughs> shit? <laughs> um, well, I'll just take it up with Jared, dude, because he's uh, he's uh, holding back on the Cheater. <laughs> I guess so. He so, needs, um, so is that your introduction to Jared? I guess. Um, I don't know if that, I think that was the first time that I ever met Jared or, you know, but I just remember afterwards, we were like, dude, we got to get that guy to play guitar for us. You know, you, you yeah. stole him. Now I had met him in 87 or, or late 86 or something like that. Um, at the Woodlawn theater, he was working for big Earl sound and they were doing a watchtower gig at the Woodlawn. There in San Oh, Antonio. awesome. Big girl. There, awesome. he was actually, I think, teching for Ron Jarzombek. It was one of the early Jarzombek gigs with Watchtower. So that would have been 87, sometime in 87. And uh, that was when I met him. And he was, he was like, I was talking to him about something. And he was like, hey, you think Ron should use my wireless? And I'm like, I don't know. You should ask him. I mean, unless you want to roll by your crib and just bring it. And he goes, yeah, I'll just do that. And I remember that conversation. And then 
the next time I saw Jared, he was on stage with you guys at Rockers opening for the toys. Right, I remember and that. I was show. like, hey, you're the dude from the Woodlawn, Big Earl. And he's like, yep. And then he, <laughs> I think he had told me there at the Woodlawn the day that I met him that he played guitar and, and that he was in, in like a cover band. He was in like a touring cover band. Of I remember he did a covering band. Um, I don't think I, I might have saw that band one time, but yeah, the bottom line was, is he was killer. And we had, we, there was no way like we thought he would say yes, you know, because oh. it was just, again, everybody to us or to me anyway, because I was a little younger than Sims, but you know, it was like, everybody was like, oh, whoa. I mean, you just mentioned like Ron Jerzombek, you're talking Billy White, you're talking you, you're talking, you know, so all these you know, Sean saw him like, you know, you know, and I was still trying to figure out like how to do anything, you know? Well, yeah. The, the cool we're, we're, we're throwing a lot of names around here and just real quick for the benefit of our listeners and, and viewers who we're, we're all Texas boys and we know each other in the background, but uh, just to recap real quick, we're talking about when we, when we're talking about Jared, we're talking about Jared Tootin, who's the producer of the talk louder podcast. Also Jason's songwriting partner in broken teeth. Um, he was in Pariah with Kyle, our guest here. And, um, you mentioned Shandon, Shandon is Shandon Psalm. You mentioned his brother, Doug, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Sean, Sean Psalm, both are the, uh, the sons of Texas music legend, Doug Psalm. So there's a lot of interconnection going on here. And I just want to clarify for people listening who may not know the names as, as, as much as we do, cause we're, these guys are all our friends. But, uh, yeah, we're talking Texas, you know, music yeah. royalty when you're talking about the Psalm brothers Thank and their father. For, Thank you for doing that, Dave. Now people are, I can, I can feel Google search uh, <laughs> a flame. Yeah. yeah. People are looking so, up. And then, you know, I didn't realize this, uh, Kyle. I grew up in San Antonio, and the first time I saw Pariah was on a, on a bill with presents. Uh, speaking of Sean Psalm, uh, Sean Presence was Sean's band out of San Antonio. And at the time they were a three piece and Sean was the lead vocalist and guitarist. And they were sort of San Antonio's big hope at the time. And they were a big draw. They played, they opened for every national act that came through town. And I remember seeing Pariah, at, this was at a pool hall in Universal City. And I always, I never knew Pariah's origins were in San Antonio because I always associated you with Austin. So, so sort of summarize the, the formation of Pariah in San Antonio um, and, and then the move to Austin and why and, and how the band that became the Pariah that was signed to Geffen sort of gelled. Um. Well, I'm really grateful that I grew up in the San Antonio music scene because yeah. it was the heavy metal capital of the world. Hell yeah. You had like Joe Anthony, 99.5 Kiss, you know, all the shows that we went to see, like you name it, dude, I, I saw it in the arena there. Like, it, you know, and it was everything from like, you know, Shout at the Devil tour to Wasp to, you know, a lot of metal Dio, um, you know, all the stuff that we grew up on. But, and there was a cool little music scene. And to me, one of the most, um, the best things about San Antonio is that no one was going anywhere. So you made music, that was your escape because there was no, like, it wasn't like you were going to make it. Like, I don't, you know what I mean? I, it was like, it was like, I mean, we all try, like, right, let's get, let's, like, we're going to be the first band to get out of here, you know? But it wasn't like that. It was more like, you know, like, I mean, it's kind of how I wish Austin still was, where it's like rich cheap. You know, you could you could get a warehouse to practice in because no one cares about that warehouse. You know what I mean? Like all those things that I think are really important to like nurturing a, a band, you yeah. know what I'm yeah. um, so we were lucky to have that is my point. And me and Sims definitely wanted out. <laughs> we just wanted to go somewhere, you know. <laughs> um, and we were really fortunate to have a you know, a mother that was super um, supportive, you know, I mean, she was definitely like the, you know, at the time we were a three piece and then a four piece and then a five piece, but, you know, mom was always the, the extra, the extra band member because she was like a, you know, she has a school named after she's like a killer PR lady. So she was like, Oh, you want to do music? All right, well, <laughs> let's rock this, you know? And, you know, Jason remembers we'd be upstairs playing like 
you know, me and Jared both had 100 watt plexi marshals. Yeah, you guys were violently loud, and she was just up down downstairs, downstairs reading a book, <laughs> smiling and just happy as hell, and and completely supportive. Yeah, that's that's when I knew that I could hang with all you guys. When I just met her and met the met all your crew and met all your your people, and it seemed like there was always this like Brady bunch thing going on, you know, and 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 happy happy vibes and. And you guys were and are great musicians, and uh, it was it freaked me out that you guys were so young and could play any solo and play put together any song, and that Shanda knew every Kiss song in the world, and you know it was you guys were winning. You guys had everything and anything that uh, that well, a young that man would would want in, in order to uh, you know here you go. Cre uh, this is your this is your room to create. Y'all go crazy till something really magical happens. So, so how did you find Dave Derrick, your your singer in Pariah? That's a good question. Um, well, we were all, we were looking for a singer because no offense, Shandon, but he would talk a lot in between songs, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we decided we didn't want the between song banter, um, you know, as much. And so we started thinking about a front man. And Shannon's a great singer, by the way. Um, I thought. Um, but either way, we, you know, we started looking for a singer and Dave was at our high school as well. And, you know, we tried out all these people and like, you know, people would come over and then our house would turn into like, you know, <laughs> like a total drug and booze den of like uh -oh. craziness. And like, uh -oh. you know, there was this one guy that I remember ended up in prison who came and tried out and, um, and then there was this one kid that, um, he just looked super cool and he was like, you know, but he had never sung ever, you know, yeah. but he was like straight up like, and we we're like, Hey, will you sing? And he came over and I, I think he hated us after that. And, um, <laughs> but yeah, Dave came over and just sang, you know, and he could sing, you know, and it was like, wow, you know, it was, well, um, well, for the rec for the record, and I don't need to say anything, but I'm going to say it just because no one else needs to probably say it because they all know already. And y'all know, of course, he's one of the baddest motherfuckers out there. Yeah. I mean, every, all the talent, the collective talent in Pariah is, is, you know, was was pretty incredible. You know, you've got Kyle on guitar. You got Jared on guitar, who was blowing doors off at the Battle of the Bands thing, impressed Kyle. So the lineup now is Kyle and Jared on guitar. Both guys went on to do amazing things. You've got Kyle's brother, Sims Ellison, on bass, who was, you know, probably one of the most charismatic guys in the scene at the time. Then you got Dave Derrick, who's a hell of a vocalist. And on drums, you got Shandon Psalm. That's you couldn't put a much better band together at that time in the San Antonio, Austin area. So it, it, it you know. And then everybody moved on to do different things. So did, did the move to Austin, was that sort of because, like you said earlier, no one ever really broke out of San Antonio, so it was the logical step or what? No, it was, it was um, okay, A, I appreciate everything y'all just said, but I have to say that all those bands were badass and all those bands, like for me, I see it more from like an insecure point of view, like y'all were like the shit, you know what I mean? I mean, you're talking like, <laughs> and so we were like, trying you know what i mean to get yeah. to well, get that's, some... that i you know that's great i mean we can i appreciate know, it but yeah, i'm just can, saying we you can, know i'm neil walker's talented as shit like all these people had you know what i mean it's just like yeah. there was talent i mean so i just want to say that but we moved to austin because all our gigs started being in austin you know okay and um and then we got wayne nagel who you interviewed on this show yeah and um um you know, people like that to manage us. And so our, you know, most of our gigs started being up here, you know? And so, and then granted, you know, me and Sims were just turning 18 and it was like, cool, we can leave now, you know? Yeah. And we loved it up here. It was like a small town. I mean, I don't know how many people there were, but what Jason, like 200,000. I don't know, but we're, you know, to put a time frame on it, you're talking about when you guys moved up here, it probably would have been around 89 or 90. Or 88 even, yeah. 88, yeah. So yeah. why were all your gigs happening in Austin? What, did, was your music just a better fit in Austin, or were you actively seeking out gigs in Austin because there wasn't much of a place for you in San Antonio? 
There was definitely a place for us in San Antonio. So it wasn't that. Um, okay. We just started getting all these gigs at the back room. Uh, okay. You know, and then, and, and, you know, places like the Steamboat and the back room. And, um, and then our management was up here. And plus we liked it up here because we play shows and, you know, you drive like five minutes and you always felt like you're in the woods and, yeah, you know, people were doing mushrooms and it was like just groovy and cool, you know, not that San Antonio's not, but you know what I'm saying? It was just a different, I don't know. We were also itching to go anywhere, like, you know, anywhere. I get that when you, yeah. when you, when you're, stuck in the same you know house and town that you that you grew up in it's it's kind of a a fantasy or a fantastical idea to even if it is just an hour and a half away you just you know drive up the road and you're in this you know alice in wonderland where oh yeah you're like we made it yeah <laughs> right. Right. Well, you're, right road, you know, you're right down the street you know it's sort of your first taste of being a rock and roll pirate. It's like, hey, let's pile in the van. It's a road trip. And we're going to play in front of people that aren't our immediate circle of friends. And they actually like us. And, hey, this town is cool. So I get it, man. You're you're young. There's an attraction there. And you're, you know, itching to get in the van or the station wagon or whatever. And, uh, you know, th that's that's kind of living the dream at that point, right? How did you – how did you – um? Definitely. You you have management now, so and this would have been what ninety, right? I'm terrible at time frames. Like, yeah, that's good. Ninety is good enough. Eighty nine, ninety. You have yeah. you have Wayne helping you out. You're hanging around the Austin Rehearsal Complex, which was new at the time ish. Ninety ninety eight. You know, um, no, 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 no. Eighty nine. No, eight, eight, what time? Did, when did the ARC open? Is okay, that hold on. That early can, I say, can I say one thing before before we leave San Antonio? Yeah, go yeah. Ahead. Okay, I just want to tell one more Jason story that happened I, in San yeah. Antonio. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Gun, Guns N' Roses was playing. This was Ooh, before. I love this one. I know this one. Oh. I love this one. Yeah, okay. and so it was before they were famous. You know what I mean? They was like, how many people, Jason? You think there was 30, 50 people there? 100 people? It didn't seem packed at the, at the Cameo Theater. At the, yeah, Is that the, the story you're talking. Yeah, no, yeah. it was it was fucking packed. It was. Yeah, it was okay. packed. For some uh, reason, in my right mind, it was like there was thirty people no, there. No, that's, <laughs> that's how I remember it because they they I had just seen them open for the Cult, mm. and so they had been they were on tour, and so they were super well oiled machine. Um, the, I'll, of course, you you can tell the story, but no, the place was packed, and the reason I I have that memory is because I played the cameo all the time, just a couple of years prior, with Watchtower, correct, and, which I saw there, and y'all came on and we we're like, for your encore, you were like, this is side two of twenty one twelve, side one, which, si all right, side one of twenty one twelve, <laughs> and by the way, that was the first vinyl that I ever personally bought on my own in a schoolyard for 50 cents. And so when y'all did that, I was just like, holy shit. And then they did it. I was like, like <laughs> I knew that was the reason wow. that I loved you, Kyle. <laughs> so, so no, it was, it was, the place was packed. And I think the only, the place only holds like five or 600 people for the record. Yeah. It was a Samuel small theater. theater. Yeah, downtown yeah. San Antonio. It's, I love that place. Yeah. Me too. It was awesome. Anyway. Well, so, so two things happened. Um, I had this pariah demo when, from when we were a, a three piece, I think, or it might've been the one with Dave. Yeah. The four piece one. Um, and so I take it up to the front of the stage and I hand it to, to Duff and Duff grabs it out of my hand. And he looks at it, throws it on the ground, stomps on it with his boot. And then they just bust into the song. And I was just like, yeah. Like it was like the cool, like it was so wow. badass. He did not, you know, he looked at it and he was like, destroy song. Yeah. Well, that's and like was, a Sid Vicious move. It was badass. And, By the um, way, this would have been about 87. Right. They this were on fire. Were, you they guys were on fire. Were, you guys were kids. We were kids. Yeah, I would have been like 16, 17. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, well, and then so at the end of the set, they, they start playing Knocking on Heaven's Door. And you could tell me, Jason, if I remember this wrong. But um, Axel's like, no, 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 and he'll stick the mic out and let people answer. You know what I mean? And he's sticking in front of some girl. She'd be like, no, no, I was no. And then some dude just passing the mic around, sticks it in front of this guy. And the guy just like blows, like just, I mean, he like answers back, knock, knock, knock it on heaven's door, but like act as good as Axel, if not better. Right. 
Wow. And you just see Axel just pull the mic back, <laughs> like just really fast. He pulls the mic back. And I just remembered me and Sims going, man, we got to go see who that dude was. Cause what the, you know, and it was Jason. <laughs> well, oh, wow. Well, you're, you're, he did. The cool thing is, is Axel did not pull the mic back. Okay. So he I'm actually gonna, yeah. let me, he, I actually went into like, you know, I was, that's natural, right? So handed me a mic. I'm going to take the motherfucker. Well, I put my hand around it and I did my thing. And he did not pull that mic away. He was cool. He was cool. He held it and he, he even kind of smiled a little bit. And I saw Steven Adler light up. I saw Duff light up and Slash turned his head like, who the fuck is that? Wow. Yeah, see, I remember it totally different. Um, um, not not, to not totally different, but. <laughs> well, you know, granted, I was like always really high. And um, <laughs> so who knows? Well, that's why I wanted to know what the real reality was. But I just remember, yeah, you. You like saying, and it was just like, whoa. I have, a, I have a thing to add. Um, uh, I remember Axel's mic stand was, you know, belonged to the sound company. It wasn't his personal, it wasn't the crutch. It wasn't the custom mic stand or anything. It was just a sound, regular old mic stand. And he used a wireless and they didn't have the right clip, the enlarged clip, you know, for a, for a wireless mic because a wireless mic is bigger. They had the kind of the, the roach clip type thing where you with a spring uh, in it where you, you squeeze the bottom and it opens up like jaws and you put your microphone in there. Well, those, for the record fucking suck, suck. Yeah. <laughs> those those clips suck. bad idea that's why you don't really see that that style of mic clip anymore but anyway so the mic stand fell at some point which is not a surprise at all uh i don't think that it axel you know axel didn't chuck it or didn't kick it or but it, it had fallen and no one gave a shit that it fell, of course. But that mic clip snapped in half. Another reason they fucking suck. They had like this little spring and they were like plastic. And yeah, back yeah, then they were way worse than. <laughs> but the, uh, I'll make this story shorter by it, um, it. It's almost over. I promise. I have a piece of that mic clip, red duct tape on it. I still have it. That's I have awesome. it. Dude, <laughs> yeah, I'm in the front row at that gig as you part of your story. I was in the front row. Uh, the mic stand falls, the mic clip breaks, that piece of plastic from the mic slid right up to me. So I just grabbed it and put it in my pocket. It was broken. They're not going to go, hey, yeah, I knew that back. You know, it was broken. Right. I still have it to this day. I never, thing I, knew, I never knew that. You, yeah. you, Jason sang with Guns N' Roses. I never knew no, that. No, well, I, that's... The other thing I remember about that <laughs> show is just that Guns N' Roses was killer. Like, they were just really good. Like, it was like yeah. they were on fire that night. It was like, whoa. Well, and this is around... This is right after MTV had that concert of them at the old Studio 54, the Ritz yeah. show. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah that, con that MTV concert is fucking balls to the wall. <laughs> and, totally. and so it was right after that. So they were, like I said, they were on fire. They were opening for the cult. They were playing smaller ven smaller venues. Think whoever booked them at the Cameo, I love you. Thank you right. so much because it changed the way people saw and listened to rock and roll forever after that show. No, it was, yeah, it was a cool, it was definitely like. It was good. We were lucky to see them. Do you remember the name of the opening band? I don't. Emerald. Oh, Emerald. I do now. Yeah. I remember Emerald. <laughs> That's right. Wow. Yeah. Emerald. I saw that. I saw that y'all, um, y'all interviewed Legs Diamond. Yeah. Um, yes. dude, I, I still listen to woman to this day. <laughs> That's, your Joe, That's your Joe Anthony influence. <laughs> well, yeah. Wow. And I, used to, I saw, I used to see them at the sunken gardens and presents would open up yep. and I just, yeah, I really All loved, I really loved Legs Diamond. And a lot yeah. of those. Yeah. They were great. So you, uh, so Pariah relocates to, to Austin. My question, um, can I finish? My question was going to be at, you get management, you're in Austin, you get management from, from that moment of like, all right, well, we got a manager now. What the fuck are we do now? Right. 
when where their when was their label interest and can you do you recall what what exact songs or you know what what songs were you sending out to garner interest and where did you showcase for your deal um well you know south I by never south knew any, i never knew any of this stuff so this is fun south, for south by we you know we became a staple at the back room as jason and you guys know and um i don't i mean i think shatter me was a big um a lot of people like shatter me and sick kid and that you know that ep that we made you know that rather your skull record that we made we sold twenty five thousand copies of that Holy you shit. Know, and we're talking, you know, on our own. 5,000? Mm -hmm. before, before Instagram and all, you know, before all this, I mean, we used to have like bags of mail because, and it was a lot to do with Metal Edge, dude. Like Metal Edge put us in there. And once that happened, then all of a sudden we started getting, you know, fans. You, and know, how then, many, you know how many young bands right now would shit themselves if they had any crystal ball to tell them they were going to be able at all to sell 25,000 copies of fucking anything? Because check this out. Check this out, dude. My friend, my friend um, in a band in San Francisco, he's not my friend. He's my friend's daughter's boyfriend, right? Okay, I'm with you. And they have like 10 million views. Wow. on on spotify 10 million views and wow. they've only they've only sold like i forget what he said like twelve thousand copies or something yeah but what's wrong with that picture how does that not i mean isn't that crazy dude like what like us what we wouldn't have done for like 10 million views you know it's like yeah, but but that yeah. means they're not no one's putting their money where their mouth is no one's buying the product in order no, to they're just, press they play just, or let, yeah, just like keep yeah, I, that's that, that's a whole new another interview. conversation. Yeah. yeah, there's a whole new interview about the devalue of music because of digital. Crazy. So yeah. Yeah, we won't we won't get into. Well, that. you know that helped that we sold some records on yeah. our own. It helped yeah. that we had a, a really devoted, loyal following. You know what I mean? It helped that. There was people, nationwide, if I don't recall, you guys cause basically cause had, because of Metal Edge, you had probably. a newsletter, you had Metal Edge Love, you had Pen Pals, you had all that stuff was happening. We, we also had, had Dangerous Toys in Austin. We also had all these other bands that were, you know, you guys got signed before we did, right? I mean, if I remember, like. Well, well yeah, it was the South by of uh, 88, March of 88, that we met our connections and soon after. Uh, we did our showcases for about six or seven major labels without leaving Austin. So that was part of my question. When you guys were, you know, who were you courting? Were you courting everyone? Was it your manager courting them? Was it your mom? Was it your president? We didn't, your we didn't, you'd have to ask Wayne Nagel. We didn't know who we were courting. You know, we were just <laughs> playing, dude. <laughs> we were playing. And like, and then we would be told like, hey, these dudes are coming. And then you meet okay. all these people. You know how it is. It's like we met Bob Ezra and we're like, whoa. And then Jared gets appendicitis or like, yeah, <laughs> you know. Told that story. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, it's just a bunch of stuff like that. And, you know, um, I mean, one of the coolest, Max Norman, did I say the producer guy? Yeah, yeah. He did the toys record. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't he do Ozzy? Yeah. Yeah. With Crazy. Rhodes? Some, yeah. some song called Crazy Train. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he did that. He did. Um, I remember um, there was a chance that he wanted to do our record. He did Pantera too, right? Am I right? No, I don't know. I don't he think did. Pantera. No. Didn't, For some reason, I thought he did. But did um, Megadeth. Did Megadeth. Armored well, State, Megadeth, Dirty Looks. It goes on and yeah. on and on and on. Yeah. I mean, you just start meeting these people, you know, once there's like a buzz. But basically, it was probably because of South by Southwest and and, you know, just that kind of hype around pariah shows, I think all kind of accumulated so so when, i mean it was 12 years right when we finally got signed of being a band wow yeah uh, well it would have been night night yeah you're right you're right you guys worked hard and it would have been your record came out in 92 so that's a lot of work that you had to do so it wasn't 12 years but it was a long time maybe it was 12 yeah. years after we broke up or whatever but it was you know it, it wasn't overnight you know to us it was just like Play shows, play shows. We got fans one by one. Like our first gigs, dude, really were in a pool hall. There's three people, you know, and you're like, we got to win over these three people. And yeah. you'd win yeah. over like one of them. <laughs> you know what I mean? But that's still a victory. <laughs> so yeah, that is a victory. I, I heard from a friend of ours, Johnny Medina, 
uh, one time he goes, you win your fans one at a time. You don't, don't, you know, it's a victory if you, if one person buys something or walks out, you know, converted. Talking about you. Yeah. yeah. You need, yeah. You, you need to think like that. Don't, you know, catch one fish and it's a great day. You're not trying to catch them all. You don't. Well, this is kind of like that thing about like, what is success, you know? And like, I remember we did like a wing Everybody tour. Everybody defines that different, man. Well, we did a wing tour with the Gibby Haynes solo record. And after the whole tour, Shane was like, "Man, it's too bad we, you know, that." that well, you that, were you were playing with Gibby on the with Gibby Haynes and for his solo tour is what you're as, as a guitar yeah. player, yeah. yeah and, um, but I just remember Shannon being like, "Dude, it's too bad that record wasn't a success." And I was like, "What are you talking about, dude? We made a record, we put it out, we toured with Ween for like three months, you know? That's, it's like it's like that's you have to look at." that you know like that's pretty like to me that's a success you well, know if you if no one got hurt no one got sick you made that's a what little... i mean if you didn't get in a car crash you know like it's... Yeah. yeah did you make a little bit of money did you you know i mean yeah your your measurement of of success and what you if you feel more deserving than what ended up happening you might want to rearrange your thought patterns well, or if you think like, you know, I mean, to me, it's like it's, you know, it's it was basically Gibby's solo record, you know, yeah. and we we, you know, we made the record we wanted to make. So, you know, I didn't think that it was going to be like Taylor Swift or some shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's just like, yeah. no, no, but the face on the cover is like, got like, you know, pearl warts all over it and stuff like what, yeah. what do you want? <laughs> I'm sure we're talking about Gibby Haynes here. So yeah, right. Of course it's going to be kind of fucked up. Yeah. Gibby, Gibby, of course, from Butthole Surfers fame. Yeah. San Antonio fame. San Antonio. Is he a, a San Antonio of... guy also? So is Charlie Sexton. But, so is JJ. I, I Butthole Charlie Surfers. Boy. Hold on. Butthole Surfers are a San Antonio band. Yep. Yeah, I never knew that either. Wow, I lived in San really? Antonio. Yeah. Yeah. No, oh, I can't believe we stumped. Metal Dave. What uh, what time period were they active in in San Antonio playing clubs and whatnot? Nineteen eighty eighty nineteen eighty. Oh, okay. I'm not 19, there yet. Yeah, seventies because nineteen eighty. Right, that's right. Yeah, because that's before that, my time. A little bit. My first vinyl appearance ever because there was no such thing as anything else. It was no maybe maybe cassettes. Uh, it would have been eighty eighty. Three or eighty four, on a, uh, a hardcore Texas hardcore compilation called Cottage Cheese from the Lips of Death. The cover, <laughs> the cover art was painted by Gibby Haynes, and the story goes like this: We just did a slew of interviews with uh, Dave McLean from SA Slayer and and Ron Jarzombek from San Antonio Slayer Watchtower as well, and we. So there's been a lot of fodder, a lot of talk about the Boss Studios on uh, Broadway. Right. Uh, Bob O'Neill Sound Studios is what that studio was called. And when we met this Watchtower guys, met the San Antonio Slayer guys, and Bob from that studio saw us play and had we had the endorsement from Slayer, yada, yada, we ended up recording there. So we're recording there. And it's 83 or 84. It's early days. And... We were the next session. We were working in the recording on spec where it was, you know, we didn't have any money. You know, we were wait. Buttholes were paying to have the day and they were mixing for this compilation record. And so they're cleaning up their stuff. And like Rick Shreves, the engineer, puts on the reels and we're going to listen to a couple of songs from the week before that he had mixed. And Meltdown comes on. And Gibby Haynes and Paul Leary are sitting there, and then melt that ding, ding, ding. <laughs> Love that. It was Watchtower the, song. Yeah, that old version of Meltdown is fucking killer. Raw. I it's love raw. it. So, <laughs> like, and I'm singing like more like Udo Dirk Snyder than I am an angry Getty Lee. Balls so, to the wall. dude. So. Gibby says, what the hell is this? And these, these kids right here, man, called Watchtower. And he goes, well, we need another song on this compilation. I want that. Awesome. Oh, wow. So that's yeah. how that happened. Wow. So, yeah. yep. Kind of, kind of just weird happening, 
that it ended up. Dude, DRI is on there. There's like all butthole surfers, and it's crazy. So, a yeah. bunch of San Antonio punk, the Offenders are on there. I'm in a band with the drummer from the Offenders in Igniter. It's crazy how that, like, incestuous the whole thing is just from being, you know, that Austin, San Antonio kind of, you know, San Antonio and Austin have are the, like the congenial twin. You know, hey, all right. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the hunch. They got the you got the hunchback, right? <laughs> like San Antonio's the hunchback kind of thing. <laughs> anyway, where were you showcasing for labels? You didn't even realize you were showcasing. They were just coming to the gigs via Wayne or whatever. No, we would, you know, we were playing the back room. And so they would always time it around that. And it would, you know, right. some of it was the South by Southwest, you know, okay. when everybody's going to be in town and stuff. Yeah. But it was, you okay. know, it was usually at the back room that, you know, like that's where Tom Zutout saw us. That's where the Chrysalis guy saw us. You know, right. the, it was always the back room as far as I remember. But, you know, I don't even know that Axel didn't hold the mic back. So I could be totally wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. <laughs> so, they, <laughs> well, you end up getting signed to Geffen Records, which is a, a pretty big deal. And and at the time in the late '80s, their roster was untouchable. They had Guns N' Roses, they had Nirvana, they had White Zombie, they had Peter Gabriel, they had Aerosmith. I mean, they and so you're a hard rock band signed to a label that's got a pretty solid roster of of uh, hard rock bands that are selling well. So it looks like the recipe for success. Well, um, just to be clear, to put timestamp on it, this is how I remember it. If you guys remember it differently, please tell me. But I think that you guys got your deal around 90 or 91, and your record didn't even come out until fucking 92 or something. Okay. I almost 93, a second. Uh, yeah. It no, almost, they, that answers so my it, question, yeah. They, um, they, you know, straight up told us that, you know, we couldn't, Guns N' Roses had, had to finish their record before they were going to release our record. Yeah. Yeah, they were putting <laughs> energy into their So you could, you, could, right. you could say, in a sense, to, to, to Jason's point, that the record comes out at a time when the musical landscape has sort of changed. But from, you know, I've had this conversation with Jared, and, and he's, he says that, um, you know, the, the label kind of was initially sort of hell bent on keeping you guys as this sort of sleazy, dirty rock band. And then, but you guys had sort of aspirations of moving into sort of a Jane's Addiction, Mother Love Bone, at, at least some shades of that sort of musical style. And you would think that given what was selling at the time, the label would be open to that maybe it is is any of this ringing a bell or am i just pulling this out of thin air it's it's ringing a bomb no <laughs> yeah okay so so why wouldn't the label be receptive to something you know usually they're trying to mold a band into something that's going to work here you guys are naturally gravitating towards that and obviously talented but th there's they're still not hearing you what's what's going on with geffen records at that point well, I think they should have left us alone and let us have a natural course as a band, you know, and our part, you know, my personal part in it is that I signed that contract. <laughs> like, um, yeah. you know, it's just, you know, it was, um, I mean, to me, it was presented in a way that wasn't exactly um, accurate, you know, it wasn't what they, you know, I mean, we had to fight for everything we got to do as soon as we signed that contract. And I don't mean that in a, I mean, you know, granted, I only have my only my point of view on this. So, you know, um, I don't I don't feel I don't feel fucked over by Geffen. Let me just put it that way. What I do think, though, is I think that we were really naive. We were really young. There's things in play. I mean, didn't even Eric Johnson get shelved for like five years? I heard that story. You know, I remember when we got dropped, Doug Psalm was like, dude, what's, why are y'all so upset? Like I've been dropped like 40 times, like, you know, but we were young, you know, yeah. we were really young. We were, you know, I was naive. Let me just put it that way. And, um, well, it could have been the, a blessing in disguise when I, my experience with a major label was we asked to be let go from the label. It's like Perfect. they're not happy with anything that we're doing. And we've been writing. We wrote 80 fucking songs and sent them to them. This was still cassette days, 90s, right? And and uh, and they're going, nope, keep writing. Nope, keep writing. And eventually we were just like calling management going, 
No, you fucking keep writing. Can you just ask them if we can just be let go from the label? And they said, yeah, sure. You guys have been nothing but patient with us and bada, bada, bada. So it was one of those things because that word, oh, man, they got dropped. It's such a negative sounding connotation that. It's not all. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's, there's plenty of, of stories of, of, like you're saying, Jason, bands fighting to be let go. Jesus, yeah. you, you guys are holding me hostage. I've Watch got things to do and I can't Watch get out of this dirt. contract. The dirt, they talk. It's the same thing with the, in the dirt. I mean, yeah. it's normal. It's, it's normal. Yeah. But when you're young, like you're saying, Kyle, and with, with respect, it's like, when you don't realize that, you know, you're you you you're only without a record out until you get off your ass and write one and put one out your fucking self. You don't need. Obviously, you sold twenty thousand. Don't miss the point that you sold twenty five thousand copies of something on your own prior to the big shining light. You know. I mean, I can't prove this, but what I think is we are about to sign with Chrysalis, and that guy was one of the heads of MTV at the time. And we were going to be their version of the, you know, they were going to put a lot into it. And I thought, I think that Geffen was kind of like, okay, this, you know, even, I mean, think about it. Even if we took away a hundred thousand record sales, you know, that's, that's, that's still a million bucks. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe they're just like, okay, we'll sign them. If they make it cool, good for us, you know, but it's also a tax write off. And I don't know, they, either way, they shelved it until use your illusions came out. Right. You know, and so and then they did finally release it to their credit. And we had to fight, you know, I mean, the whole thing was like use Bill Price, which would have been awesome. But then it was like, you can't use Bill Price until he's done with the Guns N' Roses. So that's why we were like talking to people like Max Norman and like, you know, because so we were you, like, we don't want to wait for a, two more years. You right. know, we felt like we were dying on the vine. So Tom, as, Worman, Tom Worman was available and you ended up with him, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. How was that uh, experience? I mean, I liked everybody I met. Tom was a trip. Um, I loved Eddie Delena, who was the engineer, because he, you know, he was just in the trench with us, like, you know, helping us make a record, you well, know? He's made, he's made a million records. So, you know, you want somebody like that that knows what's going to work and what's yeah, not going to work as far as where the microphones go, what you're going for in the song. I mean, you know, Tom was always nice to me, you know, took me to his house, turned me on to Neil Young when a man needs a maid, all that kind of shit. At the same time, you know, he was asleep, you know, during a lot of our session. <laughs> and Sims used to go up to him and take big pussy signs on him and shit. So <laughs> wow, that's hilarious. He was getting paid 80 grand. So we kind of thought he should be awake, you know, yeah. but yeah. he wasn't asleep the whole time. I mean, you know, you, I just, you it's remember, easy to like look back and pick on people, you know, but. Do you, you remember know. me stopping by the studio out there when you guys were recording? At the Conway? Yeah. Or was it? Yeah, I do kind of remember that. Yeah. 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 yeah that was a nice, that was a nice place you guys were recording. Well, that's what I mean. It's like, dude, I don't, you can't say Geth had screwed us over on that, you know? No, that like, shit was nice. That <laughs> was courtyard, there was this nice like sun courtyard in the middle of the building. And it was kind of like a sort of a square shaped sort of setup. And there was, there was rooms just everywhere. And the studio um, was killer. Yeah, yeah it the, was super, the rooms, super, yeah. super nice. I got to walk around and, and check out, you know, the drum room where you, where the kit was. I like, mean, to Dave's point, you know, our we were like influenced like everyone, right? We're influenced by what we're into, what we're hearing. I was young. Everybody was young. So we were trying to figure out who we were, you know, and yeah, then that yeah. transition you're talking about. I look at that more like not that we wished we were Jane's addiction because I just loved everybody loved Jane's addiction at that point. I mean, you're talking about not, nothing shocking, you know, it was killer. Are, are the EP before that, yeah. the live one, which was killer? Um, well, and they kind of they're one of those bands that sort of broke the mold, kind of like Mother Love Bone. I mean, there would yeah. be no Pearl Jam without Mother Love Bone. So it was, exactly, it was, yeah. This other shit. So we were just in the music. And we were still young and impressionable. So we're taking our interest. But the one thing that was developing for real was we were starting to find our own. We were slowly starting to find our own voice through all the pain and trials and tribulations and successes or whatever. You know, it just comes. Well, you know? I'm, I'm going to interrupt again. Sorry. Uh, no, the, go for it. The songs that you guys were writing after you wrote all your like, you know, shock rock, butt rock, you know, punk rock kind of like cock rock vibe that you had going on that was you know the late 80s and early 90s that was pariah 
and you guys had a thing going on and, and, and even a look and everything. And each guy in the band had their own deal and everything. It was cool. Um, that it's not a surprise when you guys got picked up, uh, me and the toys guys, we were not shocked at all. It was like about fucking time. You know, I've been talking about these guys for a year and, you know, it's Shit. about time. So, you know, when you think about it, <clears throat> you guys were writing this sort of different sounding song when you're, I mean, you guys had like a whole record worth of shit, maybe two records worth of shit that sounded almost nothing like what's on Tamaka Killing Bird. Yeah, I mean, I think the change started coming around Torn and Tide. You know, we started yeah. writing stuff like that. Anesthesia, yeah. like the middle section of Anesthesia. Um, you know, Did I Hear You Say kind of has that more like raw pariah guitar riff thing that I think we were evolving can into. Find, can people find these songs that that were recorded after uh, Tamaka Killing Bird? Can they find them anywhere? I think there's some on YouTube like Drift and um, okay. Something Better. Um my cat keeps no, that's wanting fine. to be in the interview. Yeah, we'll this is the first one. <laughs> <laughs> We've had cats on the show before. All right. It's quite all right. But I think that but I think that you guys just the point that I'm making is you guys were growing. And once again, you guys were young. The 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 landscape was just fucking weird. And uh, I don't care what anybody says. You're you're you know, everyone is influenced by the things that are just flying right by you. You act all hard and shit when it flies by, but you're influenced by it. You're going to think about it later, especially if it's good. And it, and if it's good, it's, it's hard inspiring. To... It's inspiring. That's dude. right. That's right. I mean, when I saw when I saw Allison change, like, I mean, what am I not supposed to be inspired? You know, it's fucking badass, you yeah, know? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So so there's there's things that are moving around internally in your creative minds. Uh so the record comes out where you, I mean, I saw you guys with Jackal and might have been a, a weird sort of match, maybe not, but who else did you guys roll with? I mean, I think, you know, we ended up, we did shows with Kicks, we did shows with like oh. all kinds of people, you right. know, we yeah. even opened up for Pantera. Um, right. We did, we did those raves with Pantera and stuff. Yeah, I, I have a good, um, I have a great story about um, Dimebag. Tell yeah. it. Tell it. Well, I just, you know, I, we, you know, when Cowboys from Hell came out and stuff, you know, obviously you're, you're in your room like, dude, you know, it's just so awesome. Um, well, you're a fucking guitar player. So of course you're going to be like, yeah, just like, right. Um, but we, um, we played a show with them. And then afterwards, um, and those guys were older than me. You know what I mean? Like, so I'm still feeling like, um, like I can't really hang, you know, like I'm not, <laughs> you know, tough worthy. enough, not worthy, all yeah. those things. That's um, all in your head, man. You're a sweet guy. You're well, good. no, but I just, I'm just telling you the reality of how I felt. And, um, but, and I looked up to them, you know, and, um, so they were like, Hey, you know, come with us to Sugars in San Antonio. Oh, and so, and so I'm like, Oh fuck, you know, am I going to be able to hang, you know? And, and in my mind, I'm picturing like, Oh shit, I'm going to have to like learn how to shoot dope right now or something, you know, like I, oh, I, I, you know, I'm making up shit, you know, I'm just like, uh, you know, um, freaking yourself out. Yeah. So we go and everybody goes to this big table and, um, and I just, I, I remember feeling like, Oh man, I, I don't know that I'm like tough enough, you know? Yeah. And, those, um, guys, those guys were rowdy, man. It was rowdy and it was fun. It was fun. But I just had that little feeling like I'm not tough enough. And, um, and then Dime, dad bag goes, Hey dude, come here. And we went and we sat on the sidebar, like away from everyone at the end of the bar, ordered a couple of beers. And we just talked about Randy Rhodes for two hours straight. Oh, and I had like the best night ever. God. And it left with like hugs and like, yeah, dude, thank you. Cool. And I was just like, you know, and I left there like, oh, wow. You know, it was nothing like I thought it was going to be. You read know? Your, he read your vibe, man. He could tell yeah. what was going on with you. Yeah. And, and he made, he comforted you. And he, you know what I call it? He let you in, bro. Yeah. You know, he was yeah. super cool. And we just like talked about roads. Wow. That's, that's that's awesome, the best, man. Yeah. yeah. Some, some it was nothing cool. like what I was fearing. You yeah, know? I was like, gonna say, like having yeah. to like sleep with a prostitute with a bunch of coke in a hotel room. You know, it was not, <laughs> none of that. It was just like <laughs> fucking Revelation, Mother Earth. You know, tonight solo. How great that! I mean, we were just like down yeah. the roads, rabbit hole. 
Yeah, that's wow. beautiful. That's wow. beautiful. See, there's a lot of hardcore sort of, you know, Daryl fans that that are going to like shed tears when they hear that that he just kind of pulled you aside and you guys had moments. That's that's just The next time I saw him was at a um in Los Angeles at a Guitar Wars. Wow, oh, wow. And um and he just came out and just destroyed the whole place. Like, yeah. you know, when hands down, everybody's like, you're, we're not, we're, you know, you win. Right. <laughs> and, um, and then I saw him in the parking lot and it was just brief, but I was like, Hey dude, it's killers. So, <laughs> oh, nice. so okay. uh, so, so the, the deal, you know, the, the album, uh, by the way, Jason mentioned the title, but I want to mention it again for our listeners. The album that came out on Geffen record was called, uh, Tamaka killing bird, the pariah album. Um, Obviously, uh, the, the, the deal ran its course and, um, you know, we, we, you can't tell the pariah story and, and I, and I want to tread lightly and I, and I don't want to dwell up, bring up a lot of horrible, bad memories, but for people, people need to know that your, your brother Sims Ellison was the bass player in pariah. One of the most charismatic guys on the music scene here in, in, in Austin, um, and sadly took his own life at one point now I, I, obviously that's that's got to be just a devastating trauma for you and your family and outside of that your bandmates and i remember the entire city of austin was in mourning um i didn't even know sims personally but when i heard that news and felt the shock wave run through the city uh it hurt man you know um certainly not as bad as it hurt you and, and your family. Tell me how, you know, how you managed to get through that. Cause you, I, I've, I've come to know you uh, over the years and, and we're talking to you now and you, you, you put on a great, uh, you're, you're very sociable, well-liked every Jason called you a sweetheart earlier and I couldn't agree more. Uh, but I know that you, you had to deal with a lot to get to a place of peace or at least the peace that you present to us. Um, if you don't mind, you know, sharing some of that with us. Um, and if you don't want to, that's fine too. I, no, I, dude, I, I appreciate, I mean, you know, it's important because, you know, mental illness is a, is real and people suffer and we lose people and, I heard something the other day where someone was talking about being suicidal and then someone else said, never underestimate the hole that you're going to leave, you know? Yeah. And um, as far as how I got through it, um, there's no got, you know, I haven't gotten through it. It's a, uh, you know, I miss Sims. I could cry right now, you know, because it's, you know, it's a true loss. And, and that's like, you know, I still miss him every day because he's still not here every day. You know, like I went to see my mom last night and I took her to the emergency room. I was there all night. You know, Sims would have been there if he was here, you know, of course, yeah. so, you know, so it's all these kind of things that, um, you know, I don't know what to really say about it besides, um, you know, there's some good that came out of it. The Sims foundation, you know, you guys, if you want to call it, I'm going to give you the number right now. It's um, 512-494-1007. And it's simsfoundation.org. And basically, you know, they help musicians get mental health care. Yeah. Um, uh, so, you know, thank God, right? Because we try to get Sims help. And it was like prehistoric back then. Right. Um, you know, as far, Jason was there. Jason re remembers a lot of how hard this actually was. Yeah. Uh, but, um, you know, as far as how I dealt with it, I didn't. I crumbled. I became suicidal myself. I lost like 10 years of my life in like one of the deepest, darkest holes that you could be in. I finally understood like asking someone to stay alive in that much pain isn't fair because you can't live in that much pain. You know, you need help. You know what I mean? Like you need help and like I needed help and Sims needed help and other people need help. And, you know, so, um, you know, it's truly um, a loss, but no, but just, and, you know, I mean, I mean, I don't know what to say about it besides, um, I wish he was here, you know, uh, I mean, how do you replace a Sims, <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. Yeah. It's kind of one of one of a kind. And we were all blessed to, 
even know him and be in the Dude, that's how I that's how I am these days. It's just like I'm just so fucking grateful that I ever got to know him. You know, I remember I was in rehab and I went to trauma treatment to answer your question about how to deal with this. It took a year. I was at like a catatonic shell. And um and it's still like it affected my dad, it affected our whole family, it spread out to affect everybody in the Austin community, like you just said. Yeah. So um what was I gonna say? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so That's you hard. so you were you were talking about uh was it were you, was it some sort of therapy or or you, you lost a year of your life or it took a year to sort of, you know, not rebuild but come back to a place of where you could manage the struggle a little better if I'm choosing my words carefully here because I, I can't even begin to Yeah. No, there was some I yeah, I mean that's definitely all true. I went to trauma treatment and ended up being gone for a year. And, um, you know, I was leaving to Hawaii to go work with someone weird like Storyville or Archangels the day that Sims died. Wow. And um, it took me um, 10 years before I could go to Hawaii because I thought it was cursed and it was just so scary to me. You know, it was like yeah. so much trauma around just even Hawaii. You know, but I finally went because I was like, I got to face that fear. Yeah. And, you know, um, it's but, not it's not Hawaii's fault. Yeah. It's no one's fault. It's know? not Sims's fault. No, it's of not, not. It's not anyone's no. fault. You know, it's um, there's. You know, but you're I don't not, know. Your, your mind was tricky. I'm just talking about the Hawaii connection, right? Your mind totally. was tricky. It was just you just felt I was that. terrified. Bands would ask me to go. Um, you know, work for them. And they'd say, oh, dude, we're going to play the house in blues in uh, Oahu. And I'd be like, I'm not going, dude. And they'd be like, what are you talking about? You work for us. You have to go. And I'd be like, you don't understand. I will not go. And I would not go. And I did not go. <laughs> well, those are, those, That's one of the things that, you know, that's not, that's, let's not look at that as like this silly thing. Oh man, that's just all in your head. This is what, this is what the foundation. Here's another is. one, dude. Here's another one. Um, when buttholes, this, this is, let me finish. The, this is what people can get help for. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Real yeah. things that can yeah. that can be a roadblock for you that you need help with. So, but you have another one. Tell us about another one you felt was cursed. Butthole surfers, not because of their fault, but when buttholes asked me to play with them, you know, I saw the buttholes. I saw Gibby come out with the shotgun and do the shotgun bit. You know, oh. and that was. I thought it was awesome when I was, you know, a teenager and I saw that, you yeah. know, scared the shit out of the crowd when Paul said, Hey, we want, you know, would you come out with the buttholes? You know, I was stoked because it's the buttholes and it's like, oh, we wouldn't yeah. want to do that. But I, I, I was like, I can't, how am I going to hear a shotgun go off every night? You know, like I'm not going to be able to, you know, I, that would just, I would have crumbled dude, yeah. just from the sound, you know? So like he, but to give his credit, he was like, what? Well, you know, I won't take the shotgun. <laughs> it was like that. Yeah. And, you know, I would never want them to not do something because you know, I don't know why he ultimately did not do it, but they didn't do it. And I didn't because uh, I really couldn't have gone at that moment. It was shortly well, after Sims that just the fact you going out uh, with them had some cathartic, you know, uh, you know, help for you internally. And the fact that they were like, if we just won't do that we'd rather have you out with us uh doing what we want what you should be doing anyway as an artist and adding to what we do as the buttholes we don't fuck the shotgun you know it, that says a lot about you know your your worth and that should in turn be healing for you i was really lucky and fortunate that they the meat puppets and the yep. buttholes did that, Dude, that is it was like a it was like a a gift um that i mean i could never thank them enough because i wasn't making it i, I mean not making it in music but in just being here still right you know and like they plucked me out of that and it was like and then they took me on the road where it was okay to be as fucked up as i was yeah. You know, I, I used to sit in the back of the, I mean, I remember we opened up for REM and I sat behind my amp because it was the only place I could get away from people and just was just losing it. And no one said stop. No one said, you know, they might have brought me some water or something, but no one was going to like, you know, it just, was just, yeah. So I was, yeah. you know, it was a safe place to be, you know. That's good. 
Yeah. I, I, a, lot I, of people, a lot of people wouldn't have been able to be away from family or away from someone who's like keeping an eye on you because the road can be, especially being on tour with <laughs> people like the butthole servers and me puppets, which were probably completely nurturing to you. But when you think about the big thing, oh man, you're on tour and you're, you're, you're suffering from a traumatic loss and blah, blah, blah. It's like somebody was looking out for you. Yeah, probably um, Sims. I don't know. I mean, I like you just said, like, you know, it'd be you, away from family. And it's like when I heard that, I just thought, yeah. And I, and I was already away from family because Sims was gone. Well, you, you know, you, you, you know, know what, I mean? what I mean? And you know what I mean when I say that around. Oh, around I know exactly what you mean. Your and mom I, and your friends and the people who just want to hold you and make sure you're yeah. okay. Yeah, totally. But, you know, it was Kurt and it was Paul and it was Gibby and like, it's well, like the best people in the world. You know? <laughs> of course, because they're fun and they're, and they're gonna, they're gonna say and do the things that, that you need to hear and be able to do. And to, they're, they, they care and they're loving, yeah. you know, they're like, they're not gonna, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, uh, I, I appreciate you sharing that. I, I know it's not easy to talk about and, and uh, I'm glad that you were able to find peace in, in small segments with, you know, whether it was with Gibby and the buttholes or out with the meat puppets or whatever. And one of the reasons I bring it up is more than anything, just to honor Sims and, and, and say his name and, and get it out there. Cause he was such a, uh, a loved uh, member of the Austin music community. And, um, and, and, and as you said, uh, if there's a silver lining that came out of this, it is the Sims Foundation that does help uh, musicians get mental health care. And it's been around for a long, long time. And that you hear you hear the words Sims Foundation in Austin almost on a daily basis. And I think that speaks to the to the longevity of the of the organization and to the passion that's behind it and to the, the commitment that's behind it. And it's all in the name of Sims. So uh, somewhat I, unprecedented, I, I, if you ask me, I think it I might be. I don't yeah. know of a lot of I mean, I think that they have a program in New Orleans, the you know, huge music scene there, of course. And I think that there's programs like that that are spotted but not every music community has something like the foundation so yeah i, I want to jump forward uh if i may and yeah. can i say one more thing about that though but of course you sure do. Say whatever jason, you want, dude. jason and sims lived together and um you know so that was um super sweet because um you know sims was kind of going through some really hard times and he needed some place to land and i remember he landed with jason for a while so that was well, it was, dude, we can't, we can't, uh, that's sweet of you to say, but it was Jeff, the Jeff Tweedy mansion. It was Jeff, oh. <laughs> Jeff Tweedy was our. We should um, have a whole podcast just about Jeff Tweedy. I don't, like, I, just, I, could, I would love to do that. Is this, uh, is this the mansion I'm, I'm familiar with? Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah. And I, and it was just like, I, I, I don't, I don't want to call him the landlord because <laughs> I didn't really pay much rent. <laughs> <laughs> and I should have. And Jeff Tweedy is kind of like one of those angels that you kind of read a book about. And his name is just not Jeff Tweedy. Well, let me tell you, the name they're not saying is Jeff Tweedy. And I don't mean Jeff Tweedy from Wilco. Wilco. Well, it's Tweedy a different Jeff Tweedy. Pro probably, probably an, an angel. angel. <laughs> probably, probably an angel in some, in some form. But the Jeff Tweedy I know is, yeah, the angel I speak of. Um and it was great uh, uh, to be there uh, with Sims because I loved Sims. I know you did. It was, he would come in my room when I, he would hear me writing songs and go, I really like that one. Or I really like that one. And, you know, that, that meant the world to me. Uh, but what sucks about that whole thing is, like, when, when we were kind of, Tweety was kind of closing up shop there uh, and, like, Sims moved out and it was it was mere days later that he was gone. So that's the scariest part for me because this is how tricky this kind of stuff is. Um I was gonna say that, but you you take it. Well, I just I don't know, but I will tell you like three days before Sims died, um, you know, we had been trying to, you know, help. Uh, yeah. but we didn't even know what that was, you know, but we were trying. And um me and Sims went to eat at Guero's and he looked like 
he looked so beautiful to me that I literally, I started crying because he looked for the first time in like a year, he looked good. And I got that hopeful feeling like maybe everything's going to be okay. You know, and, and it scared me because he, you know, that how much I loved him was right there and how, and how, how, you know, he was just glowing, dude. I mean, he looked yeah. beautiful and I just, and, and I got scared. I just said, promise me you're okay. You know? Yeah. And he looked me right in the eye, eye and he was like, dude, I promise I'm okay. Don't worry. Three days later, he's gone, you know? And, um, that's hard. That's hard, bro. Well, dude, it's all hard. And, you know, and I don't, I don't, you know, I don't, there's so many things that could contribute to like, dude, I mean, you know, and I don't, I'm scared to even say them because it might, you know, shed a light on something that's not a light. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. But who knows, dude? I mean, he was on all these different antidepressants. They kept switching them. Uh -oh. You know, like, he, yeah. yeah, they would just he'd put them on one, take it away, put them on a different one, take it away, put them on a different one. And it's like, I'm not against antidepressants. I have friends that had literally saved their life. Yeah. But, you know, I could tell that this was not working for sense. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's just, it was all scary, you know? And, um, and well, yeah. That's, that right there, that story right there is another reason how, how slippery of a slope it is and, and how important, you know, it is to talk to someone and get some help. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. it's just, we all, yeah, we're all human and. Yeah. What are we going to do, dude? We got to try to serve. I don't know. That's right. Hey, let's talk a little bit about other, like, um, before we let you go, uh, talk about other, because, dude, your list of, like, people that you've worked with, toured with, recorded with, you mentioned the butthole servers, you mentioned uh, the meat puppets, mm -hmm. and, I mean, you, you've you recorded and toured with, I mean, those are two huge, uh, huge uh, underground sort of alternative for lack of a better term hard rock bands um who have are universal and and, and ministry am i right on ministry did you yeah, do tell us a ministry gig story ministry um was different because when i was in the buttholes i started making films because you know they do all the projection stuff Correct. and i did, and i just you know, went off the deep end, just getting into that because it was fun. You know, you paint on like film leader and all this stuff. And, and they were like, cool. And they were like, Hey, dude, you want to do some of this with the buttholes, you know? And so, so I was doing that too. And a um, ministry asked me to go out and do their video. Um, but I didn't want to, um, you know, just have like a sympathy track and you just play a video you're talking ministry, right? Yeah. So I was like, dude, we're going to make a video instrument and we're going to make every song have video samples that, that are, you have to play the song to the song. And if you fuck up, it's going to fuck up the video. And, and so we did that. And Matt Mitchell from the skate Nicks was part of this. And he I wrote when you were working with him, I'd run into you guys. You guys were working on shit. All yeah. Time. And so he helped write this software because there's no software to do this at the time. And it's, so we just took it like as far as you could take it. Cause you know, we used to call him Matt 3000 cause he could do anything. Right. Like he's like figure this, anything technical, Matt was going to solve it and make it rule. And it was going to rule. And also I will say Tristan Rudat helped make the video. Don't want to leave him out because he's, yeah super talented video editor played um in a band called 151 um but yeah so ministry asked asked if we go do that and there's a million ministry stories you know but that's how i ended up meeting paul barker and working with him i did some stuff with led into coal with him but only a few songs on that first record and um right but paul and tristan have been helping me on this new band that kind of came about because the pandemic which is called zoid and that's just oh, this that's cool band name. Yeah, it's called Zoid. And it's this crazy, you know, it's, it's kind of like what the pandemic did to, you know, the isolation. And so I was like, what if you could just make the craziest music you could think of, like from the future? And there was no rules. And if you thought you got went too far, you just like go way farther than that and like destroy any concept of like yourself as a musician, like what you think you do. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. And um. And that was super like fun, dude. And like, it just like was relieving too. Cause all of a sudden it's like, you know, like I think I play guitar a certain way, you know? And this was fun. Cause it's like, fuck all that, you know? Yeah. Make <laughs> like, yourself play a different way. Yeah. yeah. So it's, yeah, that's a fun project. And um, reinvention. That, 
Yeah. Yeah. And Paul played, we were lucky enough that Paul played bass on some of that. Oh, and um, Paul Barker. Yeah. And, um, and of course that just like, you know, it was heavy and cool. Yeah. And then you give it to Paul and he's like, Hey, what do you think of this? And you're just like, Oh my God, dude. Because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, you know, he's like, I call him the dark angel because, you know, he's an angel to me, but it's just like, <laughs> like it's just, right. Like he's a distortion artist. He's like, <laughs> yeah. So, dude, you know, distortion yeah. artist. That's it's totally great. Well, he, he has his own design of like pedals and shit. So, yeah. Yeah. No, he's so, really amazing. So, so he's, he's, uh, um, I'm sorry. Uh, can 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 people go hear some of these void songs that were Zoid. created? Zoid. Zoid. Yeah. There's a well. There's a um. There's two singles out right now, and yeah, that you'll crack up, Jason. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> where, where are they? Where can they find? Where can we? Find um, you could go to iTunes. You could go to YouTube and like just watch the. You know, yeah, it's, it's not a video, but O I D Zoid. Mm-hmm. Okay, just yeah. make sure. There, there's there's a lot of things on your list that that we sent out that that you could. What else was on there, Dave? I wanted to ask if I may about the. Weren't you guys in a Madonna video? You were. You, were, you just stole my thunder, man. Okay. I'm gonna make him talk about that I, on the way out. But yeah, because uh, uh, and, and the only reason I'm asking is because I mean you don't get bigger than Madonna, and I think people would. Uh, be interested to know if they can look for you and spot you in the video and how that even came to be that guys from San Antonio, uh, from Austin by way of San Antonio end up in a freaking Madonna video. How did that happen? And what was okay. that? I'm going to tell you that story and that's a Sim story. So that's a good story. Okay. Um, okay. But we have to mention one artist just because he deserves to like, you know, we should all be listening to Rocky Erickson, right? Yeah. Like, Erickson so, sure, yeah. um, that's one person I got to play guitar for game, for a game short changer. time. Game changer, yeah, Rocky the, Erickson. The I evil... have a Rocky Erickson story too, but this is not about me. Go ahead. Well, no, I just I love Rocky so much, and that record, The Evil One, I highly recommend everyone gets it. Nice. And uh, yeah, so that's all I want to say. Like, we can't leave Rocky off the list because it's Rocky, and probably Absolutely. this. How many How many shows did you get to do with Rocky? And and it was about yeah. two years, maybe a okay. year and a half that I played with uh, Rocky. Yeah. But it's I ran um, into you guys at the airport uh, one time. You guys were com- we were coming and going. I I don't know if it was I was with I Bro- remember that yeah for dangerous toys. But and I just saw Rocky sitting out front of the airport. Hey dude, what's up? Well, he's just like the sweet. Like he was the one that I was just so honored and so like you know I just was like you know and um and I just wanted to be like you know okay this is like Rocky so like he was no different than than Lemmy Kilmister to me. Oh wow! Yeah, same lead kind of legendary living legend, like living, breathing legendary guy. Yeah, and uh, it, it, people need to look that up. If any kind of music, psychedelic, heavy metal, whatever, hard rock. Uh, uh, the thirteenth floor elevators is yeah. a bunch of great. You can yeah. go there. Um, exactly, it's a rabbit a, a rabbit hole in on its own. And dude, you've played with fucking legends. I got to play with you. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> Turned it right around and it's poked true. Poke me in the eye with it. No, I mean, dude, come on. I got to play with you. Well, we we wrote, the, we wrote a song together. I know. Yeah. I got to play with Jared. Jared's it, a legend. Yeah. Did, did the song? Did you guys record the song that you wrote together? Yeah, it's on Tamaka Killingbird. Yeah. Ah, okay. Which this song is, is? This means war. Okay. Yeah. Did not know that. Yeah. Dude, you need to read the fine print. I know. I'm, <laughs> I'm slacking. I'm, I'm the guy that always reads the fine print. Tell, and I didn't tell us know the that. story, the Madonna story. Yeah, give us the Madonna story. And then I'm. It I, just in on Talk Louder News, the Madonna story. <laughs> and then I'm going to have to. I got to. I got to. He's right. somewhere, so. Yeah. Well, hey, I just wanted to thank you guys for what you're doing. I I've watched a bunch of the interviews that y'all awesome. do with people, and like when I was watching them, I was like, why am I even on here? But, <laughs> but you're like, not the first person to ask that. Let me just throw it at you real quick. You're one of us. Yeah. Okay. Well, I just want to say what y'all are doing is super cool, and I'm super thank glad you. you're doing it. And I, yeah, like I've, I, you know, I just thought it was super cool. So. Thank you. Thanks, well, it, it's a thankless job. But obviously, it's not a thankless job because we're getting we're getting a lot of that like, 
why the fuck they want to talk to me? And I just, I really love it, but why are they want to talk to me? Kind of this vicious. And, and then me and Jason text each other back and forth to go, oh my God, we can't, you know, we have guests like yourself and we had Brian Small from The Hangman and he said the exact same thing. He said, I looked at all the people you've had on the show and I'm like, why the hell do they want to talk to me? And, <laughs> and me and Jason go, why the hell did, would they even accept the invitation? We're just yeah. as baffled as you are. So, <laughs> well, no, dude, it's and we appreciate it, man. Yeah. Thank uh, you. For well, no, it's just awesome. I mean, you know, well, we're anyway. not getting paid for it, <laughs> and neither are you. So obviously, yeah. <clears throat> there's a nerd factor. You know what I mean? Yeah. We, 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 we love look for them. fellow nerds. Yeah, we yeah. we end up we end if we don't know the 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 person that we some because sometimes we'll we'll be introduced to someone that seems like an interesting character and we'll want to have them on the show for, for just that's all the reason that we need sometimes. Right. And then we end up falling in love with this person. And it's like, man, that was a great episode. We didn't know what to expect. And that wild card happens not very often. I would love it if y'all got hunt sales. That would be sick. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Set it up. Set it up for us. All right, that'd be yeah. awesome, dude. Um, um, so the other uh, thing, the other thing would be is like, um, you know, we get to, we're, you're our friend, so we already know it's going to be a grandiose episode. We're yeah. gonna like go deep. We're gonna have fun. We're gonna, we're gonna laugh. We're gonna cry. We're there's all these. It's like an onion, right? Yeah. It's gonna be it this. It's like an onion that you peel. And then a thousand other little onions pop out and they just keep popping yeah. out. Yeah, and we can't, we can't stop talking about shit we want to talk about. Okay, Madonna, 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 go. Uh, so we were recording at Brooklyn Studio, which was in Madonna's management company's office, right? And it was a was cool she studio. running her record label out of there? I think Maverick? so. Maverick. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's what I so, remember. Um, and, you know, what we were like... Guys, what were you guys doing at... Which part of the record were you cutting at at... Brilliant. We were do we had we had done all the drums and stuff, but we were doing like guitars and overdubs and vocals and okay. bong hits. No, <laughs> but <laughs> we, yeah, you know what? It may have been Brooklyn that I went to then. Maybe. Okay, yeah, yeah. It may have been Brooklyn though. Um, for some reason, I thought it was Conway, but it doesn't matter because no, no, it doesn't matter. So you're yeah. in, you're in Madonna's studio basically. Doing bong right, hits. and so the studio's here. There's a kitchen, and then there's this hallway where it's like all these people at desk doing Madonna work, right, and stuff like that. And so we would ride. <laughs> what we do you like, think they're doing, Kyle? Madonna work. What is Madonna work? At that time, they were putting out the sex book. Do you remember that? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And um, so we were like riding our little twenty inch BMX bikes down the halls. You know? Oh shit! And Inside we were just the fucking studio. Yeah. Oh, you fucking like. So we were just having fun okay. and and like you know causing trouble sort of. And um, one day we were in the kitchen, and it was like me, Sims, Dave, I think was there. You know, whatever. We were just all in the kitchen, and Madonna walks in, and she's making um coffee or something, and we were about to go to Hollywood Billiards to play pool. And Sims being Sims and never really, you know, everybody was like equal in Sims's eyes, right? Like, yeah, you know, no, I mean? that part of Sims, that's a beautiful thing about Sims's soul is the filter. He's like, he can walk up to a rattlesnake. He can walk up to Madonna. He could walk up to Jesus. He could walk up to anyone. Exactly. Go, yeah. Dude, what's up? Uh, totally. Hey, what are you doing? Are you making coffee? Hey, yeah. Madonna, are you just making, can you make me some? <laughs> And mean it too, and not be like nothing, like you right. know, yeah. yeah. And um, so he was Sims, and um, <laughs> he's like, hey, you know, Madonna, you come play pool with us. And she <laughs> just kept stirring her coffee, didn't look at him, oh. didn't turn around, nothing. Thinking about it, and then, of course, I'm sitting there going, God damn it, Sims just pissed off Madonna. <laughs> like you know, Sims just pissed off Madonna, and then she just turns around. I can't remember what she said. She might have turned around and said, but I can't really remember, but I think she did say one thing, but she said, I think she said, I don't just go play pool or something. And then she just oh, walked shit. out. Oh, fuck. And, and I was like, dude, you just pissed off Madonna and Sims was being Sims. Boys like, oh. well, man. Well, fuck. he was just like, oh, whatever, dude. She's fine. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, yeah, that, I, God, I, I just had a flashback. Yeah, I could, I, and, I like I was there. Yeah, so, um, so, the next thing that happened is I was tracking guitars with Eddie and I was standing between the big speakers. So Eddie's in front of me at the mixing console and I'm tracking guitars and Madonna opens the door. 
Whoa. And so I just like stopped playing. And Eddie's looking at me because we're like in the middle of the track. He's like, dude, what the fuck? And I'm like, but yeah, you know, Madonna. And um, so, and then she just goes, hey, come here. And so I just, you know, do what Madonna says, right? Like, so I just like go. <laughs> and, and she goes, she hasn't given me any info, nothing. She goes, stand up against the wall. And I'm thinking, like, is she gonna slap me? Like, or like, who knew? You know, I didn't know. What's like, it, what was, what's Eddie doing? Did he just stop the tape and say, he just "Where stopped. the fuck are you going?" No, he just stopped. He saw Took Madonna. Oh. She asked me to go with her, so he just and was he like, was, All right. he, said, "He said go. I'm I'm getting paid. Go ahead." He didn't, yeah, he was just like, "If Madonna asks you to go, you go." You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so she got you up against the wall. She, yeah, she pulled out a Polaroid. She took a picture, and she goes, "Where's that blonde kid?" And I go, my brother? And she was like, yeah, the one who asked me if I could play pole. And I and I go, oh, he's not here. And she was like, well, when he gets here, send him to my office. And I was like, well, like, I know where your office is. You yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> and she was like, oh, and then she lightened up. She got really cool. She was like, dude, you just go down the hall. And then when you get to that last receptionist, my office is to the right, right? Okay. So I go back in, I tell Eddie the story. And we decide we're going to play a trick on Sims because he was about to come to the studio. So we start packing shit up, right? And so Sims walks in and I'm like closing the guitar case. And he's like, what are you doing? You're supposed to be tracking, you know? And I'm like, I'm like, dude, you pissed off Madonna. Like, we're out. She kicked us out. <laughs> I, was, I was like, she kicked us out. We got to go. And he was like, shut the fuck up, dude. And I'm like, no, seriously, like, we're out. And Eddie's like, it's true, dude. Like, rapid cables, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> And um, Sims is like, bullshit. Like, he gets straight up like, you know, this, now he's protective of Pariah, right? Like, he's yeah. like, you know, Sims was kind of like the band leader. And I'm like, if you don't believe me, go talk to her, dude. Her office is right down there. Like, I totally set him up, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> I was like, her office is right down there to the right. Of course, Sims just gone. You know, and then he comes back in like 30 minutes later and I'm like, we're, me and Eddie are cracking up. You know, we don't even know what happened, but we're already laughing because it's like, dude, you know, what happened? Right. And I'm like, what happened? And he was like, oh, he was like, she she wants to know if we'll be in her video. And I was like, I was like, well, what'd you say? And Sims goes, well, I asked her how much it paid. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, how much does it pay? He goes, 300 bucks a day, dude. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and so, nice. I'll take it. Yeah. So then, um, you know, Sims is in the video a lot. You could see him in there a lot. Um, me, I'm only in there at the first scene, like when she pulls up in the car and I'm like the guy that looks like Cousin It. That's like, what song is this? Deeper and Deeper. That's okay. Right. Yeah, so I'm like the kind of the prostitute on the corner with like super long hair. And then there's another scene where I'm in the hallway and she wanted me to act like I was selling pot because I had asked her, I was super bored on the set and I was like, can you give me some pot? And she was like, so when the, that scene came along, she was like, well, just, yeah, do what you do naturally. Like, just pretend like you're like selling pot or something. Not that. <laughs> so I, I did, but Sims is in that video a lot. You could see him. And then there's another guy, oddly enough, that looks kind of like a muscular Sims. Mm. And he's in the video a lot too. So a lot of times people will be like, oh, I saw Sims. And I'm like, yeah, but that that's the other dude. Sims is the dude with the candle and the, yeah. Wow. So anyway, it was just one of those things. And then, um, yeah, she was really cool. Like she was like, you know, I mean, I, she was like, just treated us totally normal. Like once we got there, she was like, I saw her get a B12 shot and she was like, what's up? And I'm like, I'm bored. So she was like, well, what do you want? And I was like, well, I want to like, is there any weed around here? <laughs> and she, she was like, looked to her assistant. And then I remember I went behind the building and she goes, just do it over there. So like, it's not a big deal. And I was like, yeah, okay. Oh, that's cool. So wow. Madonna scored weed for you? Now her assistant. <laughs> Same thing. And then, but her and Sims would just talk like, like, Normal. like Sims would talk to my mom. Yeah. Just yeah. like totally cool. What wow. a great story, man. Yeah, like, wow. I mean, you've, you've, you've shared so many great stories with us today, but, uh, I, I don't think I have any other acquaintances that have been in a Madonna video. <laughs> so <laughs> you're the only one. You and Sims. Yeah. It's Sims is blame Sims. He was I mean, you know, I think I just think that it was Sims like 
just was like Sims, you know. Well, and I think she- it, it goes back to that charisma that I was alluding to earlier. Exactly I, right. I, I think yeah. people just took one look at him and fell in love with him before he even opened his mouth. And then when he opened his mouth, it was just, you're a goner, man. <laughs> well, the, the cool thing about him was, as I, I mentioned, that his filter is different than ours. You know, he was able to walk up to Madonna and go, hey, let's go play pool. You don't know me from shit, but let's go play pool. And she was like, I don't play pool. Next thing you know, you're in her fucking video scoring <laughs> weed for you. And, uh, well, and you're so paying, right, dude. Paying you're, you paying you 300 bucks a day to just be there. You're so right about that. Because just like being his brother, there was so many times I was like, dude, Sims, like, you you know, watch what you say, dude. Like, what are you doing? And he would always just be like, whatever, dude. Like, what? <laughs> right. So. Oh, man. Well, listen, uh, Kyle. Thank you so much for yeah, having me. No, thank you guys. Thank real. you. Yeah. Thank you so much, man. I, and um, yeah, I saw the LA Guns one. I saw, yeah, so I'm super yeah. into it. Keep going. Master Pussycats back there. Some, oh, you're talking about the episodes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, man. Um, you, uh, you're in good company. And, uh, and we thank you for being with us today because we appreciate all your stories and uh, your friendship and, and, and your honesty and just sharing your, your life with us. And uh, we wish you continued success in everything you do musically. I hope this uh, album with Renee comes to fruition at some point. Yeah, uh, you just, keep us posted on that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so just thanks for being here, man. We appreciate it. Yeah, and thanks, Jared, too, for... Yes, yeah, yeah absolutely. None, none of us would even, none of us would be here without Jared. I know. That's the truth. His, That's the his truth. whole idea of this thing during the lockdown is was just like crazy. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell the story again. He calls it goes, What do you think about you and Dave being in a podcast? Oh, that sounds fun. And then we do a couple and we're like, Oh, that was fun. What's for dinner? And he's like, No, hold on a second. <laughs> Jared Brain's like, No, dude, you're fucking out of your mind. You dude think a hundred or 200 episodes and it just felt, a like, ah, it just <laughs> felt like so daunting to think like that here we are it's like we're, we're like knocking 100. on a hundred we're, we're, we're 100 in the 90s now too. that's awesome yeah good name too i like the name thanks ah yeah. uh there, there's a there's a psalm connection to that name correct jason uh, is there? Yeah, it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a play well, on Rock Louder. Well, I, I, I didn't mean it. When I thought of Talk Louder, yes, I'll take the credit, I, <laughs> I said to myself, wait, wait, Talk, oh, Rock Louder, the present song. Rock Louder, yeah. Mm-hmm. I thought of that when it, just because it rhymed, but yeah, that would be the play on it. So yeah. there you go, Sean and Shandon. Yep. No, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. It. All right, Kyle, thanks for being with us. On behalf of my co-host, Jason McMaster, I'm Metal Dave, along with our special guest, Mm -hmm. Kyle Ellison. Thank you all for listening to another episode of the Talk Louder podcast. Thanks. Have a good one, y'all. Boom. Boom.